Hey guys, I'm your host Tara A. Devlin, and welcome to this week's episode of Kowabana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. My latest book Yamakoa, The Haunting of Mount Yami, is now out. If you like terrifying mountain stories full of ghosts, monsters, and other creepies, then do check it out. It's available on Amazon right now. This week we're looking at a few stories dealing with the sacred, and why you should never mess around with it. First up is a local legend known as Shine Shine Sama. This spirit, if it even is a spirit, whispers, die, in people's ears, but otherwise isn't known to cause any harm. That is, until new people move in and start going insane one after the other. What's really going on? Find out in Shine Shine Sama. My village is a so-called countryside town, about an hour's drive from the big city. We don't have any big shopping malls or anything like that. It's best to think of it as just big enough to have a supermarket and convenience store. Well then, let's get right to it. This story is about Shine Shine Sama, a harmless existence that's widely known around town. All he does is whisper, die, into people's left ears. That's really all there is to it, despite the terrifying sounding name. When you're alone in your room, you might hear a voice whisper, die, into your ear, and it's terrifying, but no actual harm comes to you. As long as you ignore it, the voice gets bored and eventually goes away. Sometimes the voice is persistent, and other times it disappears just like that. It all depends on how Shine Shine Sama feels at the time. The time and place is random, and sometimes you might be alone, or sometimes you might be hanging out with a friend when you hear it. Shine Shine Sama just told me to die, and so on. Kids love to speak boastfully of it, and he's treated as an undeniable existence in our town. Now that I'm writing all this down, I've realized it must look really weird to outsiders. But where I live, It's so ordinary that it blends into the background scenery. And then, the wave of civilization came crashing through our village. Chainsaws cut down the mountains, bulldozers cleared land, and a new town was born. There were factories and employment in the big city, so there was a single road built from this residential area leading into the city. Our village was only an hour from the city, and I had relatives who lived there, so it wasn't like all these new people coming to our village was an issue, but there was just one single problem. And that was Shine Shine Sama. His name was just no good. So at the primary place of education in my village, the elementary school, it was forbidden to speak of Shine Shine Sama. Anything related to him at all was forbidden. The grown-ups watched TV, so They had common sense and knew that they shouldn't scare the new people coming in from outside. Plus, they didn't want people thinking that there was some weird religion in the village. So they made sure that Shine Shine Sama wouldn't become a topic of conversation anymore. Then things got weird. Specifically, there was a spat of suicides and such in the newly built residential area, the new town. More specifically, People who didn't know about Shine Shine Sama started to go nuts. They kept hearing a voice muttering, die, by their ear, so it wasn't exactly the nicest thing ever. To put it another way, we were fine in our village because we knew that no harm would come of the voice. When things start going wrong, when your life starts going down and you hear a voice telling you to die, then you start to think that, yeah, I should probably just die, right? That was what I thought, but I was wrong. It turned out that Shine Shine Sama was actually called Chine Chine in the Showa period. The reason the name changed was because of the Shine Shine group. They were the name of an evil organization in Mirror Man, and because Chine Chine, and Shine Shine sound alike, that's what people started to call it. 
Mirror Man was created in 1971, so he's a hero from exactly half a century ago. The generation that played and pretended to be him would be in their 60s now. My grandpa, who's close to 70, was apparently raised hearing Chine from Shine Shine Sama. But after Mirror Man was broadcast, this apparently changed to Shine or Die. While the show was on air, Chine and Shine were equally used, but the word Shine Shine Sama was so powerful that only 20 years later, Chine Chine had been replaced entirely by it. In the past, he used to whisper Chine. In the present, he whispers Shine. There's no way that Shine Shine Sama suddenly became interested in Mirror Man. That's just too weird. While we found all of this strange, the people living in the new town kept losing their minds. Let's call this guy Aikun. So when I was in high school, my younger brother in elementary school was friends with Aikun. He used to come over to our house and play, and he was a likeable kid. So likeable that I wanted to trade my own brother for him. Forgive me, I'm 80% telling the truth and 20% joking. It's still difficult to think about him even now. He was pretty much family. One day, Aikun suddenly stopped coming over to play. I thought maybe he was fighting with my brother, but apparently he hadn't been to school either. I could understand if it was only a week or two, but by that time, a month passed, and even my brother realized that something strange was going on. My brother, being my brother, tried to do something about it, but he was only an elementary school kid, so he didn't get very far. Which meant it was time for his usually unreliable older brother to step in. Me. At first, I thought maybe that he was being bullied. It's not like there's no bullying in the countryside because kids' hearts are clean or anything like that. Bullying is still a normal problem. And because Aikun moved in from the big city, that would actually make him more of a target for bullying. Now, it wasn't like I learnt martial arts or anything, but I should have been able to strong arm an elementary school student purely with my strength. And so, I tried to get the name of the bully, but I wasn't able to hit the mark. I got a name, but it didn't make any sense. At any rate, the culprit was, according to Aikun, a monster face. Or, according to my younger brother, Shine Shine Sama. My brother and I went to Aikun's house to see him. When we saw his mother, she looked the epitome of the word exhaustion. She looked just like what you would expect from a mother whose son hadn't been to school for a whole month, and even just remembering the look on her face now is still painful. An exhausted man is kind of dirty looking, but an exhausted woman has a kind of unfathomable horror to her. I think that the family relationship must have started to break down around the time Aikun stopped going to school. She thanked us for coming to visit, but didn't show any signs that she would let us into the house. I figured we should go so we didn't bother her any further, but my brother didn't want to. Having gained such a strong ally as his older brother gave him confidence. Come on, little bro, don't think that highly of me. As we hung out at the front door, almost getting into an argument, we heard Aikun's voice. He was desperately screaming, like, Ah! And wah! I remember Aikun's mother let out a big sigh when she heard it. Now that I'm an adult, I get it, but she didn't want us to see her son in that state. But unable to hide it any longer, she let us in and showed us to his room, and we finally met him for the first time in a long time. He looked just as exhausted as his mother did. He looked even paler and in worse condition than the last time my brother had gone to see him. His cheeks were puffy, his eyes bloodshot, and he kept hitting his left ear over and over. Ah, he's hitting Shine Shine Sama, I thought. Shine Shine Sama always muttered in your left ear, 
and it was like your left shoulder got a little heavier when he did so. When Aikun heard the word whispered in his ear a few months prior, he turned to the left. It was then that he saw Shineshine-sama. It was the first time I'd ever heard of someone seeing him. And Aikun said that he'd been following him around almost every single day. He might have looked so exhausted because of fear, but to put it more simply, it was probably because he couldn't sleep. If a voice was muttering in your ear 24 hours a day, then of course you wouldn't be able to sleep. Look, Shine Shine Sama whispers die in your ear, but if you ignore him, he'll go away himself, I told him. But Aikun wildly shook his head. No, he said. He won't go away. I heard the voice say Shine. My grandpa heard Chine. But apparently Aikun heard something slightly different. Something ne. He said it over and over again, but it honestly just sounded like shine to me. Many years later, I realized that it was exactly the same as being unable to tell the L and R sounds apart. Normally, we heard either shine shine or chine chine, so we never actually caught the correct pronunciation of what was being said. That was why. Even if we heard Shine Shine Sama's voice, nobody had ever actually seen him before. But Aikun transferred to school after it became forbidden to talk about him, so he happened to hear the correct pronunciation, not being influenced by any prior knowledge. Aikun's drawing of Shine Shine Sama looked like a face with arms and legs coming directly out of it, like a picture a kindergartner might draw. But the only difference was that the eyes alone were strangely darkened and black. The limbs extending from the face were thin, like bare branches. It was a picture drawn by an elementary school kid, so it wasn't exactly terrifying. But watching Aikun try so desperately to portray what Shine Shine Sama looked like was terrifying in and of itself. He said, the big face would sit on his left shoulder, and with small hands, he grabbed his ear and whispered in it over and over, almost 24 hours straight a day. Sometimes he would go somewhere else, but then, when he fell asleep, the muttering would wake him up again. At the time, I didn't understand how difficult it would be not to sleep at all, so I was more confused than scared and I wanted to do something to help him. But thinking about it more closely, I didn't know anything. I didn't know what Shine Shine Sama really was, nor how to deal with him. I didn't know a single thing. Why the hell was I even there? What was I supposed to do? I felt sorry for being such an unreliable big brother. I tried to get help from our reliable grandfather, but he was no help either. He wasn't exactly our village's priest or head monk or whatever, but we couldn't even get our holy grandfather to help. His specialty was funerals, not exterminating monsters, he said. The only way to deal with it was to have heard the story of Shine Shine Sama beforehand. Then you wouldn't be able to hear the correct pronunciation because your mind would simply hear it as Shine instead. Then, because nobody was ever harmed that way, nobody ever looked into other ways to deal with him. That was why we couldn't help Aikun's insomnia with any modern methods. I say modern because Aikun himself found a solution. If you find yourself haunted by Shine Shine Sama, then all you have to do is cut off your left ear that he grabs onto. He was unable to bear going without sleep, so Aikun, an elementary school student, grabbed a knife from the kitchen and cut his own ear off. The sound of the ambulance rang throughout town. It wasn't until a week later that I learnt of what he did. It was something that us kids and teens 
didn't need to know. As a result of Akun's not so modern way of dealing with things, his family soon moved far away. There wasn't a lot of gossip I heard, being a high school kid and all, but I don't think that you could say it was a happy ending in the end. Whether it was because he moved away or because he cut off his own ear, who knows? But my little brother told me that apparently Akun no longer heard the voice anymore. His parents also got divorced, and judging by the name on the letter from him, Akun then took his mother's last name. I tried to find out more about who Shine Shine-sama really was, but my grandfather stopped me. There was an unmanned shrine near the temple that had been simply managed since the Meiji era. As we learnt in our social studies textbooks, the split of Shinto and Buddhism was dealt with by simply cutting the temple and shrine land in half. Meaning, to put it simply, Shine Shine-sama was a type of tatarigami. It wasn't like he tried to bring harm to people, but the mere act of trying to interact with people could harm them. And apparently, there are all sorts of things just like him all over the world. Ghosts, yokai, evil spirits, yakuza drugs. You can find all sorts of things all over. That was why I was told to let sleeping dogs lie. If I wasn't ready to spend my entire life holed up on a mountain somewhere, then I should leave it alone, he said. And so, on that note, Shine Shine Sama is still around and healthy as ever these days. Time passed and the new town is now old, but the people who live there are still weird. Sometimes I wonder what pronunciation they hear whispered in their ear because it's clearly not Chine or Shine. But at the same time, I absolutely do not want to know for sure. Next up, we're heading into the mountains where a village worships a particular Kamisama. A young woman invites some of her friends to her family home over the holidays, but they break a local taboo and soon pay the price. Can they still be saved? Find out in Kami Residence. I'm a science major dealing with chemistry research, the entire opposite of the occult, but I've long loved things like fortune-telling and the supernatural, although I've never been able to see ghosts and such myself. That was why I never had any such experiences up until the summer holidays of this year. Looking back on it now, I was happier that way. I had a classmate by the name of Asan at university. She came from the Tohoku region and was very quiet and elegant in nature. We became close friends, and as I got to know her better, I discovered that she had a strong sixth sense. When I visited her apartment one time, I found a large Shinto charm hanging in the corner of a very clean room. It was quite the strange sight in an otherwise monotone and clean room. And strangely, she was really good at telling people's fortunes using some items I didn't really understand. Every now and then she apparently saw things and, if I pestered her enough, she'd tell me. She was at times a little bizarre, like she would hug trees when she thought nobody was looking, or talk to spiders and such. But we were science majors, so, you know. There are all sorts of people who are interested in the occult, but Asan was an upstanding person, so nobody really treated her any differently and most just thought of her as a little odd sometimes. Sorry for the long introduction. Now, let's get right to it. During the summer holidays last year, four of us, including myself, went to visit Asan's family home. They lived in a mountain village, so deep in the mountains that the closest train station was still more than a 30-minute car drive away. It was the kind of place where it wasn't rare to see a bear suddenly pop up in your yard once in a while. Now, Asan's grandparents lived in the house alone, but there was a hot spring nearby, so 
Asan invited us over to go hang out. I'll call the others B and C. There was a mountain right behind her grandparents' house, and there you could find various shrines and sacred trees that Asan had spoken about before. It was a rather small mountain that didn't take long to climb, but despite the fact it was summer, the air felt quite cold. Asan showed us around the shrines and sacred trees and said, they protect this mountain. It was like being in the world of Higurashi. I remember B and C were especially excited. After that, we went back down, but on the way, we noticed a small path off to the side that we hadn't seen on the way up. What's that? I asked. I've never been down there before, but I was told that I must never, ever go down there, Asan said. When you're told that you can't go somewhere, that just makes you want to go even more, right? B and C were also the types to listen to Asan's occult stories as though they were nothing more than fun tales. They didn't believe in the supernatural, so they suggested we go down and see where the path leads. Asan stopped them with an unusually strong tone of voice, and we all proceeded back down the mountain. But the next day, something seemed to have happened while Asan and I were out shopping. It's not like it was interesting or anything, B and C said when we got back. I didn't know what they were talking about, and they said they went down that path we saw the day before, and at the end was just a large, abandoned house. When they were done, Asan snapped and went off. What on earth have you done? She normally never raised her voice, so all three of us were shocked. She went to tell her grandparents what happened, and then her grandpa came over all angry as well. Did you go to the Kami residence? He asked. Kami residence was apparently the name of the abandoned building, and both B and C apologised to him. It's probably too late already, he said, and then turned to Asan. But we should at least try it. Her grandparents' house was quite large, and he guided all of us to a single room in the back. There was a grand Kamidana altar in there that looked a little different to the usual ones. On top of the shelf was something that looked like a small Oinari-san, surrounded by Sakaki branches. Asan then entered the room, but she was wearing something odd. She wore something like a white kimono over her usual jeans and shirt, and she appeared to be holding a short sword in hand. By that point, I was already freaked out, but then she made B and C sit in front of the altar, facing each other, and she started chanting something I couldn't make out. As she did that, her grandfather sprinkled salt while her grandmother cried. The atmosphere in the room was terrifying, and honestly, scared me. Before long, Asan's voice got louder and louder, and then finally she screamed, pulled out the short sword, and then stabbed it into the tatami. The three of us were almost in tears, but it seemed that was the end, and Asan returned to normal. Of course, the mood was rather heavy after that, so the next day, we thanked Asan's grandparents and then rushed back to Tokyo. That was where the real horror if you want to call it that, began. First, despite the fact I had zero ability to sense the supernatural, I started suffering from sleep paralysis all the time. While that was happening, I could feel something like a dog on all fours sitting on top of me. It stank like a beast, so I don't think it was a human spirit. When I told Asan about it, she returned with a charm, much like the one in her apartment. Make sure you place this in the northeast. Treat it with great care until all this is over, she said. I figured it had something to do with our summer holidays, so I quietly did as she said, and the sleep paralysis stopped. She apparently tried to give B and C something similar, but after what happened during the holidays, they were afraid of her, and 
They avoided her like she was someone dangerous. Troubled, she gave the charms to me instead to hand over to them. She's terrifying, they said. She's dangerous. In the end, they wouldn't take the charms, and when I told Asan that, all she said was, I see, and immediately dropped the subject. After that, B and C's relatives started dying one after the other. B's parents died in an accident, and her sister died of an unknown poison. C's mother, who was already in the hospital, also suddenly died. Then her father killed himself and her older brother drowned. It was like all their relatives, one after the other, were taken out over the course of just a year and a half. B lost it and dropped out of school, and C suddenly packed up her apartment one day and then disappeared in her car. A former workmate of hers said, she left suddenly during her shift and then the next day was gone from her apartment as well. It's not like she went back to her family home either, she just mysteriously disappeared. We still don't know where she is, by the way. Asan never spoke of B or C again, but last winter holidays, she suddenly asked me to come back to her village again. I was scared because of what happened last time, but considering what had happened to B and C, I agreed to go. It snowed heavily, and the village was beautiful. When I saw her grandparents, they were the same gentle grandparents that we had met the first time as well. But when I showed them the charm that Asan told me to bring, her grandfather looked a little sad. So it didn't work, huh? He said. Then they started to explain everything. The village where Asan's family lived believed in a mountain Kamisama, and Asan's family had a duty to revere that Kamisama. However, that role had previously belonged to another family in the village, and that family once lived in the now abandoned house. However, one day they suddenly all went missing, and the inhabitants of the house were all possessed by the spirit of a beast. One member jumped from the top of a cliff, another threw themselves into an abyss, and the remaining one died of a mysterious poisoning. But the deaths didn't stop there, and over the next two years, more and more people died and the entire family was wiped out. After that, Asan's family, who had never married anyone from the other family, took over their role in the village. Strangely, that very same night, Asan's ancestor had a dream of a white beast who appeared by his bedside. The beast told him the location of the tree where the Kamisama's Goshintai was buried, and told him to dig it up and dedicate it to the Kamisama. The beast also told him he must not enter the abandoned mansion. Asan's ancestor did as he was told, dug the something up, and then placed it in his house. That something was the small Oinari-san that I saw at the rear of the altar. After that, in each subsequent generation, more and more people in Asan's family were born with strong supernatural abilities, and the mansion up the mountain became off-limits. But the story didn't end there. Before the war, a man from the village secretly entered the house. He was struggling for money, and was hoping to find something of value inside. But after that, members of his family started dying off one after the other, and two years later, his entire family was wiped out. The same thing happened each and every time someone went in the house. After that, the building was reverently named the Kami Residence, and people apparently stopped going inside it. There were falls, drownings, and poison, Asan told her grandfather. I see, he said, and her grandmother also sighed. It's said that if three people die in the same way as the family possessed by the beast, then their entire family will be wiped out. However, if there's a complete stranger in the family, 
someone who married in from the outside, or an adopted child or something like that, then some family members may be saved. In the past, most people married within their same village, so complete outsiders were rare. And that is what happened. I still don't know what happened to C, but Asan and I still see each other like always. Our last story for this week features a man whose family is connected to a cursed object, and when that object suddenly goes missing from the temple where it's being stored, the man finds out something even more terrifying. Where could the item be? Find out in Ignorance. Recently, I found a certain copy-paste on Nichan, and when I saw it, I remembered an incident that I'd almost forgotten about that happened a few years ago, so I'd like to write it down here. It happened about five years ago now, during the summer holidays. I was a junior high student, and something was stolen from the temple near my house. There were two treasure vaults inside the temple, and the contents of one of them was stolen. Now, if that was the only thing, then it could be chalked up to a simple robbery, but there was something strange about what happened. Our family had been parishioners of that temple for generations, and the following day, our family included, all the parishioners of the temple and people who live nearby were gathered to discuss what happened. I was just a kid at the time, so I didn't think much more of it than, wow, that sucks and didn't really pay attention to what was going on. A few days later, I was playing some survival games with air guns on the mountain behind the temple with my cousin, who was the same age as me, and some other friends when the head monk approached us and asked us to follow him. I want to talk to you, he said. I thought he was going to yell at us for making so much noise on the mountain near the temple, so I nervously followed him. He led us into the temple, and then told us to sit down. There was a strange look on his face, so my cousin and I thought we were in big trouble, and shrank back. But on the contrary, he didn't lecture us, but started talking about something else. His story was hard to believe, and absurd, but at any rate, he told it with a serious look on his face. According to the monk, one of the treasure vaults in the temple houses scriptures, statues, and things of similar value. But the other one was a treasure vault only in name, and actually stored something else. And what was this something else? By their nature, temples and shrines receive a lot of unlucky or cursed items that people want to cleanse or have them take away entirely. But most things are generally in people's minds, or just coincidences that pile up and have nothing to do with the items, so in general they refuse those, and instead offer a prayer, or convince the owner of another path they can take. However, in cases where the person absolutely insists, or the rare times they come across a real cursed item, they have no choice but to take them in. And so, that vault was full of these so-called cursed items. Because it would take time to cleanse all of the items, the vault existed to store them all. These items didn't have any monetary value, they were just dangerous in spiritual terms, so in general, they were never stolen. But this time, they had been. Two things in particular had been taken and one of those was an item related to my family, so he summoned me to tell me about it. And so, the theft was of cursed items from that vault. The thief no doubt saw how well locked up it was, and thought the items inside must have been extremely valuable. There were several cursed items in there that must never be taken out, so the vault was heavily locked, more so than the other treasury. He explained the two cursed items that were taken to us. One was a Japanese sword, and the other was a Buddhist statue made out of gold. Ah, yeah, 
They would definitely make a lot of money if you sold them, I thought. The sword didn't have anything to do with my family, so I'll give a broad explanation of it. A man brought it to the temple when the monk's predecessor was working as the chief priest. Please, just take it, the man said. The chief priest initially refused. It would be a crime to take this without permission, he said, but the man forced the sword upon him and then left it there. I'm not a specialist, so I don't know the value of it, the monk said, but it was considerably old and the inscription of the name had been scratched off. Apparently, the man who brought the sword claimed that he kept having dreams in which he killed people with it, and he feared that, at some point, he really would kill someone with it, so he took it to the temple. The chief priest didn't believe the man's story at first, but starting that very same day, he also started having dreams of killing people with the sword, and so he decided to lock it up with the other cursed items. He spoke to the police about the sword, considering that the sword and firearms control law was in effect, and somehow was able to convince them to let him keep it locked up at the temple. The other item was the Buddhist statue made of gold. This was the item related to my family. Now, I'm calling it a Buddhist statue, But according to the monk, he'd never seen a Buddhist statue like it before. He simply called it that out of convenience, because of the similarities, and so, strictly speaking, it wasn't actually a Buddhist statue. The statue was found almost 150 years ago by my ancestors, when they were cleaning up after a large flood. It was amongst the mud and debris that had swept down into the village from the mountains, Because it was made of gold and looked like a Buddhist statue, they were happy to find it and took it home to place in the altar room. According to the monk, it must have washed down from the top of the mountain in the flood, but the area I lived in was already deep in the mountains, and there were no other villages above it. A few days after they brought the statue home, strange things started to happen. Cats and livestock started dying of a mysterious illness, not just in my ancestors' home, but in other houses in the area as well. A short while later, some of the many children my ancestors had started to die one after the other as well, and of the ten children they had, in half a year, only three were left. At first, they thought it was some type of epidemic, and the village tried various measures to stop it but nothing worked. When children started dying in other families, that's when they noticed something strange was going on with the golden statue. When they first picked it up, the statue's expression looked close to emotionless, like there was no way to tell from the face how it felt. But when my ancestors looked at it again later, it was clearly grinning, and its face had changed into a smile. Even scarier, there appeared to be red lines growing from the statue's feet, going upward, that looked just like veins. At first, they just pretended that it was nothing more than a figment of their imagination. But each time someone died, those veins spread higher and higher. Unable to handle it any longer, they then took it to the chief priest at the temple. The statue was made of gold, so... That was probably why they were reluctant to let go of it for so long. The chief priest at the time had heard rumours of the statue, but he had never seen it himself. But when he saw it for the first time that day, he knew at a glance that it was something dangerous. He didn't know why it was made, nor how it came to be in the village, but there was no denying that it was a powerful, dangerous, cursed object, and if they let it be, it would wipe out the entire village, so the chief priest immediately started praying to cleanse it. However, a few hours after he started the exorcism, the chief priest started bleeding from both ears and eyes, and he was found dead inside the main temple building with a horrifyingly warped expression on his face. His cause of death was unknown, but there was no doubt that the statue 
was somehow involved. The reason people knew was because the veins on the statue, which before the exorcism reached roughly hip height, had now risen to the statue's neck. When the villagers saw that, they knew the statue was too much to handle, and they devised a plan to dispose of it somewhere. Then the chief priest from the head temple came to visit the village. This is too dangerous to deal with all at once, I'm afraid, he said. The only thing we can do is keep it at the temple so the danger doesn't leak out, and over several generations, we must weaken it. This isn't something you can just throw away. He persuaded the villagers, and over several generations, the power of the curse was weakened as the item was kept at the temple. It was a little lengthy, but that was what the monk told us about the cursed stolen items. He then continued, telling us this story. Over the past few years, at the time, so more than ten years ago now, an increasing number of temples and shrines had been targeted by thieves, and most of them were committed by gangs of foreign thieves. The problem with that, of course, is, just like I said, there were numerous temples and shrines just like this one that had treasure storage that was full of problematic items, and several of them had been stolen as well. At the time I used Nichan every now and then and read lots of copy pastes, so I immediately realised, ah, the thieves must be from that country. But when I asked the monk about it, he just gave me a vague answer. Instead, he told us another story. Supposing that was true, and that thieves from a certain country were involved in all the thefts from temples and shrines, then that meant the cursed items were likely being sent back to that country without protection. This was an extremely dangerous practice, and there was no telling what might happen if all these cursed objects were gathered carelessly in the one place without protection. Normally, people don't do stupid things that are of no benefit to them, the monk said. But strange as it may seem, curses have affinities for others, just like people, and if we were to compare them to people, then there are some that would get along with each other, and others that wouldn't. If all of these things were gathered without restrictions and regulations, then the monk said, something terrible might happen. Who knows what might happen? But if the items have been taken out of the country, then we're safe, right? I said to the monk. We can't be heard if they're no longer around right? That's not so, the monk replied. Even if you don't go yourself, such a large, disorderly gathering of cursed objects still presents a danger if you have a connection to them. Even if that connection is not very strong, there's no telling what might happen. Supposing that you have a connection to them, then no matter what you do, you won't be able to escape. That's everything he told me at the time. To be honest, I didn't believe what he told me. That was why I completely forgot about it until recently, and that's where the copy-paste I first mentioned comes into play. When I saw it, I instinctively felt that it must be related. A huge thank you and shout out to this week's Kami Tier member, Baked Beans. It's thanks to your support, along with everyone else, that I'm able to keep doing this show, so thank you very much. Don't forget to pick up Yamakoa, The Haunting of Mount Yami, available on Amazon right now. And check out our newly revamped merchandise store at koabana.store. And if you'd like to chat about this week's stories, come and join us in the Koabana Discord. You can find that link in the description or on koabana.net. You can also check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash Tara A. Devlin for exclusive bonus stories and extras, or our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Japan for all sorts of Japanese horror you won't find anywhere else. Thanks guys, stay safe and I'll see you again next time for even more Kowabana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. 
Want even more scary stories? Head over to koabana.net for new translations every week. You can also join our Patreon for exclusive stories you won't find anywhere else. Head over to koabana.net now.